everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our first ever, first ever virtual live Pachaka Cha. We're here tonight at the Rawlings Library hosting our 29th edition of Pachaka Cha Pueblo. Pachaka Cha is Japanese for chit chat and is the world's fastest growing presentation platform used from millions around the world. In 2003, Klein Ditham Architecture, based in Tokyo, invented PK. The initial purpose was to streamline long design presentations because the architects thought people liked to talk too much. The format is simple, 20 slides, 20 seconds each, concise and engaging. Pachakacha is a tool used to share stories, passion, and knowledge. Since 2003, more than 3 million people have attended PK nights from around the world. Tonight, we have eight wonderful local presenters that I would like to introduce in the order that they will be presenting. Co-presenting first, Trent Ryan and Valentina Gutierrez, Joan Chun, Reed Weber, Lucille Corsentino, Jen White, Derek Lopez, Karen Fogelsong, and Jude La Follett. After all the presentations are complete, we will have a few minutes um, for the presenters to answer any comments or questions that you may have. So please feel free to enter any questions or comments throughout the night and please be sure to address who your question is towards. Now let's get started with our first presenters, co-presenters, Trent Ryan and Valentina Gutierrez. Good evening, everyone. We would like to take this time to thank Rawlings Library for having us here tonight. We would also like to thank all the people watching the live stream. Your continued support of Pachacuca is amazing. My name is Trent Ryan. I'm Valentina Gutierrez. And this is Still City Entertainment. I respond to COVID-19. We are living during the worst global pandemic in history. COVID-19 has swept the world by storm. In stages, society began to shut down. First, the hysteria, the lack of supplies, the empty shelves. Nosotros estamos viviendo en la pandemia global más horrible de la historia. COVID-19 ha estado arrasando con todo a su paso, comenzando con todos los lugares del mundo cerrando sus puertas, la histeria, la falta de alimento y, por, y probablemente las estanterías vacías. Then the closures. The national and the state level closures left the country without schools, universities, national parks, and recreation just to name a few. Pudimos ver cómo todo empezaron a cerrar sus puertas, desde la parte nacional del país hasta la parte estatal, dejando al país sin escuelas, universidades, parques nacionales y recreativos, solo por nombrar algunos. Then we had the city closures, the city parks, the libraries, and even the city river walk. We began to lose access to the things and places that make us a community. Vimos cerrar todo en la ciudad, como parques y bibliotecas, e incluso el Riverwalk. Ahí empezamos a perder acceso a las cosas que nos unen a nosotros como una comunidad. We then began to lose access to the internet, to information, and to technology. We began to lose access to media and entertainment as a whole. Perdimos el acceso al internet, información y tecnología que nos ofrece la biblioteca, perdiendo el acceso a medios de comunicación y entretenimiento. Restaurants, movie theaters, bowling alleys, bars and nightclubs, all forced to close in response to COVID-19. Restaurantes, cines, boleras e incluso discotecas, todos fueron forzados a cerrar a causa del coronavirus. Then, Several, several months later, we began to see light. Businesses and restaurants and other places in public began reopening with heavy restrictions. Después de varios meses, empezamos a ver la luz al final del túnel. Restaurantes y otros lugares empezaron a abrir sus puertas, con muchas, pero con muchas restricciones. Face masks and other social distancing practices became the new normal. Sanitation methods evolved drastically, and the world began to adapt quickly. Máscaras faciales, distanciamiento social y otras prácticas similares comenzaron a ser normal alrededor de la sociedad. Métodos sanitarios que evolucionaron drásticamente, forzando al mundo a adaptarse rápidamente. As some, businesses, as some businesses were able to recover, others were not. 
the extended shutdown periods mixed with a lack of widespread government assistance led to many permanent closures. Algunos negocios pudieron abrir nuevamente sus puertas, otros no tuvieron la misma suerte. El extendido periodo de paro y la falta de asistencia gubernamental generalizada dejó muchos lugares cerrados permanentemente. The effects of COVID-19 will be felt for many years to come. Rest in peace to every life lost during this unfortunate time. But for those who are still here, what else has been lost? Los efectos del coronavirus se sentirán por el resto de los próximos años. Que descansen en paz todas las vidas que, que se perdieron durante este lamentable tiempo. Para todos aquellos que estamos aquí todavía, ¿qué otra cosa más ha perdido? Here at Still City Entertainment, we are taking aim at the heartbreaking amount of people forced to cancel not only birthdays, graduations, weddings, but all sorts of life events. We invested in a way to give back, a way to help. Still City Entertainment. Tomando como objetivo las desgarradoras cifras de personas forzadas a cancelar sus eventos, como cumpleaños, graduaciones, bodas y otro tipo de celebraciones, nosotros invertimos en una manera de ayudar. Esto es Still City Entertainment. Still City Entertainment is a locally owned, community focused, bilingual company. We focus on business ethics, customer satisfaction, community growth, honesty, and respect. Still City Entertainment es una compañía bilingüe. Estamos ofreciendo servicios completamente en español e inglés, incluyendo consultas y aflicciones de lengua hispana para todos tus eventos. Como compañía, nos sentimos muy orgullosos de poder ofrecer estos servicios a nuestra comunidad latina. With that, Still City Entertainment launched June 1st, 2020, as a direct response to the COVID-19 outcry in the city here to fill a community need and the entertainment needs of the city. Estamos localizados en pueblo, enfocado en la comunidad y la ética empresarial. Ofrecemos servicios bilingües para así garantizar la mejor satisfacción a nuestros clientes. Honestidad y respeto son uno de nuestros valores que nosotros ofrecemos como compañía. La cantidad de eventos cancelados por COVID-19 es asombroso, incluso a nivel local, sin mencionar aún todos los quinceañeros, confirmaciones, bautizos y eventos de la comunidad. The amount of events canceled from COVID-19 is staggering, even on a local level. We have yet to mention quinceañeros, confirmations, baptisms, community events. Entertainment companies are booked out. The community is still recovering financially. So we decided to launch behind a 30% off discount on all services. La comunidad se está recuperando financieramente finalmente. Así que hemos decidido como equipo otorgar un 30% de descuento a todos nuestros servicios. This company was literally built on stimulus checks and tax refunds. Still City Entertainment is a direct response to meet a need in the community. Nuestra compañía fue fundada con los incentivos del gobierno y devolución de los impuestos. Este uso de este tema es la respuesta directa a lo que la comunidad necesita. From Pueblo County to Pueblo West, Still City Entertainment is here to provide color, celebration, entertainment, and basic life back to the community. Desde Pueblo hasta Pueblo West, Still City Entertainment está aquí para dar color, alegría, entretenimiento, celebración y traer la vida de vuelta a la comunidad. Rooted in tradition, this company was born to help. We are truly invested in every member of our community affected by COVID-19. With our skills and abilities, this is what we were able to do. Enraizados en la tradición, esta compañía fue creada para ayudar a nosotros. Nosotros estamos totalmente comprometidos en cada, con cada miembro de nuestra comunidad. Con nuestras habilidades y destrezas, esto es lo que podemos hacer y esto es lo que estamos ofreciendo. So please, if you or anyone you know has an event or celebration that has been affected by COVID-19, please contact us now. Like I said, my name is Trent Ryan. And my name is Valentina Gutierrez. And this is Still City Entertainment, a response to COVID-19. Así que si sabes de algún evento o celebración que ha sido cancelado por coronavirus, por favor, contástenos ahora. Yo soy Valentina Gutiérrez y esto es Still City Entertainment, una respuesta a COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. My name is Joan Chun. I'm with the Cambodian American Lawyer Arts Association, also known as CLA. Um, I just want to tell you about our organization. I'm sorry, I went to do this, Sumphia. Um, this is a traditional Cambodian greeting. Um, so everyone. Um, so the Cambodian American Lawyer Arts Association, also known as CLA, um, is a writing organization in the United States. Um, the idea came about in 2016 by Dr. Ko. Um, and I just want to talk, to, uh, give you a little bit of history about the, about the genocide, the Khmer genocide. The Khmer Rouge was a brutal regime in Cambodia, killing over 2 million people. Um, last, it was from 1975 to 1979. Um, they created classes, rural society, um, and separated families and killed a, killed a lot of people. Um, as you can see, that's known as the killing fields. Um, and a lot of people um, came, uh, fled, fled Cambodia. They were in refugee camps in Thailand and ended up in places like Lowell, Massachusetts, where there's a big immigrant society. Um, like my family, myself, that's where I grew up. Um, there's a big multicultural community there. Um, a lot of Cambodians make up the highest Southeast Asian population in Lowell. And as this is a photo, <laughs> as I can go back. Uh, right now, this is the current leadership in um, Kla. Um, we can see the board, the board and the officers, and the new ED, Lena, and um, I myself am one of the co-founders and um, the current director, um, deputy director. And our first meeting with Clara was actually at the Pollard Memorial Library in Lowell, Massachusetts. We were in a very small room. That's where ideas formed for this writing association. Our goal is to have more Khmer writers, more multicultural writers in the community, more books on Khmer culture and all the different cultures in the U.S. And we're here to support aspiring, emerging, and established Khmer writers and multicultural writers in the U.S. The Khmer culture is a beautiful culture. Um, we have, uh, you know, dance, traditional dance and music in April every year in the U.S. We celebrate Khmer New Year. Um, that's when all the Cambodian communities come together, um, and we sing and dance and we eat together. And here you can see this is Inko Dance Troupe in Lowell, Massachusetts. They perform every year um, for Khmer New Year. Um, this is the one of our projects for Claude. We actually create um, the Still House Zine. It's a literary arts magazine filled with the voices of the Khmer diaspora. So it's, um, it's a beautiful product, I believe, and I'm so proud of what we do in CLA. Um, we collect submissions from all over the U.S. and the world. We have um, submissions from the Netherlands um, and California, Massachusetts, New York. This is one of our meetings in actually... Um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We all got, uh, we put our mind together to fly there to meet one of the online designers and the graphic designer to put the zine together. And this is a really grassroots project. We kind of just came together as a community to, because right now there's no, so, uh, there's not enough books on my culture and multi multicultural cultures. <laughs> Here's a workshop in New York City. Um, this is hosted by Asian American resource um, writing workshop. And um, th we do workshops on writing, poetry, um, um, and anything that involves writing and literary arts. We want people to be able to use their voice and writing skills um, to say what they want to say. Uh, this is another workshop that's actually in um, the Lowell Public School System. Uh, one of the literary artists, Princess Moon, she um, taught kids how to kind of talk more about their culture and, and write, write their feelings down. Writing is really important. It's just one way that we can all um, use our voice to say what we have to say. Um, CLA, the Cambodian American Literary Arts Association, we're a woman-led um, organization. Right now is myself um, as deputy director, Lena Severn as ED, and uh, Sanri Penn as executive director. We all volunteer our time, so we're really grassroots, we're really young, we got a nonprofit status in 2018, um, and uh, we're all volunteering our time. I mean, it's almost like we spend so much time together talking. <laughs> um, 
This is the pandemic perspective from the US. We actually got recognized by Southeast Asia Globe in, um, in Southeast Asia and Cambodia. There's an office in Phnom Penh, um, and they give us a voice to share perspective during this time. Um, some of the articles target um, anti-racism in the US during COVID-19 um, and, and general feelings. Some of us you know, had loving people pass away during that time, so we're able to voice ourselves during that time. Here's some uh, pictures of some of all our volunteers and uh, staff members holding up the stilt housing. Then these are coffee shops in Lowell, Massachusetts right now. Our, the third issue of the stilt housing is actually on food and identity. We asked everybody to submit writings on how they felt about um, how food shaped their identity. So these are some egg roll skewers that I made. Um, I love egg rolls. <laughs> They're a part of a big part of our celebrations, Khmer New Year, birthdays, um, any any happy day <laughs> event, any celebration, we always have that. So um, uh, egg rolls, they're, they tied, they're tied to my identity. Um, these are a, lot, a bunch of books um, by multicultural writers. A lot of them are Khmer writers. Um, we're starting a new book club um, soon, and we hope that everyone will will be curious and want to know what it, what it's about. You know, what are Khmer writers saying in this day and age? What are they writing about? You know, is it still about the Khmer genocide? Are we, are we moving to a more contemporary subject? Um, and actually, we're writing about all of it. Um, last night, we actually hosted an online event called Community Dialogue Documenting Solidarity Addressing How Black Americans in 1978 um, actually helped um, Southeast Asians um, admit to the U.S. There was a lot of people who were, you know, didn't want us in the U.S. And um, this document just showed the solidarity that Black Americans had for Asian America, uh, for Asian in the refugee camps. Um, this is actually another workshop that we had um, relating to the still housing. They're writing, writing about families, um, genealogy stories in Khmer. It's called Grusakyum. Um, and this was also in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, we have a lot of people that's interested just to write. Whether you're starting, you're already writing, you want to publish a book, we're here to support that dream in any community, in any culture that you have. Uh, we're all start, so as I said, we're a young organization and we, we don't have a lot of funding yet, but we're volunteering our time. Um, we've created a new membership program to try to raise some funds so we can keep the still housing publication going. Um, this is Laura Lee, <laughs> one of our board directors um, in New York. And she, she's amazing. Um, so we hope you will go to her website later and check out our new membership program. Um, I know I mentioned Lowell, Massachusetts a lot, but um, we will be representing uh, uh, my culture at the second annual multicultural festival in Pueblo, Colorado. It's hosted by Matt Fresh Productions and the organizer is um, Javier Quinones. The event will be on October 11th at Mineral Park. So look, look that up on Facebook and hope you will join. And you come see me again, <laughs> pick up a zine. This is our logo, um, our new logo, um, actually. Uh, and the concept is an open book, a motif that symbolizes collab's vision to foster a unique space for storytelling and preservation of those stories. No fears, distant pattern and, and versatility. The grama in the book um, is a pattern, uh, a Cambodian experience, the two elements together um, is a symbol and represents the unique perspectives of the Cambodian diaspora. Thank you. All right, well, hello, everybody. I'd like to thank the Rawlings Library for inviting me here today. <clears throat> My name is Reed Weber. I'm a person who's born and raised in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm very proud of the town that I come from. So today's just a little bit about me and the things that I've experienced here growing up. So the picture you're looking at is me and my family, my wife, my three children, and our dog. We also have a couple cats that are, you can take them to the river walk. So <laughs> um, <clears throat> I started my educational journey here in Pueblo, Colorado at Trinity Lutheran School. I went there from kindergarten to eighth grade. Uh, it was a very small school. I loved the fact that we were able to pray and learn about God and the Bible while we were there. I made a ton of really good friends, some of them that I still talk to today and are some of my best friends. So um, education-wise, for, for the beginning of my 
life, this was a great place to learn and grow. Um, after Trinity, I moved on to high school and I was a South Colt. I graduated in 2004. And as everybody from Pueblo knows, it's a very important um, piece of knowledge to know about somebody is what high school they went to and what year they graduated. That way you know whose cousins you're related to or who you hung out with back in the day. Um, so South Colts was a, a great place to learn and grow and enjoy and build my network. Um, after high school, a few years later, I started at school at CSU Pueblo. Um, I went there for a good number of years because I was a non-traditional student uh, managing a restaurant, raising my family, and trying to earn a degree at the same time. I graduated with a business degree from the Hassan School of Business and also another degree in Spanish, uh, a bachelor's in both of those. I take a lot of pride in the education I got there. Um, I mentioned I managed a restaurant while I was going to school. That restaurant was Park East. I worked there for 11 years and I love the restaurant industry. If anybody knows me, they know I love being in a restaurant. I love eating there and working there and everything like it. Um, working there, I, I made a ton of really great friends that I still t know and talk to today and I uh, learned a lot about the industry, was able to be creative and have a lot of fun while I was doing that. Um, after I graduated, I got into insurance, and Hub International was the place where I got my start in, in the insurance industry. Um, I really enjoyed working there, the people I got to know. It's a very large insurance brokerage. I focused on property casualty insurance, so for your home and auto for a couple of years, and then I did commercial insurance for a couple of years out of there. Um, while I was there, I also earned an associates in general insurance and a uh, associates in risk management. Uh, but I needed to move on and I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial and that's what brought me to New York Life. It's a company I'm very proud to represent and be a part of. They're 175 years old. This is not their first pandemic. They've been through world wars, riots, and everything else that we're going through um, through all the years. And so I take a lot of pride in the knowledge and expertise that this company allows me to tap into. Um, and that introduced me to one of my, my biggest passions right now, which is life insurance. I, I thoroughly enjoy helping my clients with their life insurance needs, whether that is um, just some term insurance to protect you and your family or whole life insurance so you can save some money for your retirement. I love talking to people about it. Not everybody knows how versatile and how useful life insurance is in all of our lives. Um, if you've ever talked, so this kind of is a look at life and kind of where it goes. And I, I kind of like to look at this and, and say I can help everybody in any stage of life that they're in, whether they're just sitting on the couch and working and building up or they need help budgeting or they want to understand how their finances are going to work when they're in retirement. Um, a lot of those health care issues that can come up in those later years. I have conversations with people about that every single day and I help them with it. Um, I'm my own boss with New York Life. I'm a business owner with them, and as such, I get to do a lot in our community. One of the places I'm most proud of is the Sangre de Cristo Art Center. I'm on their board. I, I serve there, and also a couple subcommittees with that board, and I really enjoy their mission and their drive to bring the arts to Pueblo community, and they do mean everybody in our community, uh, from Free Friday Arts to a lot of different things. Another board that I serve on that I'm very proud of is the United Way. Um, it's a very large nonprofit organization that exists to support other nonprofits in our community. They do a lot of fundraising, they do a lot of giving and of time and money in a lot of different ways, and I'm very proud to help serve our community as part of the United Way. Um, one of the best things or my favorite things that I do as part of the United Way is their United their men, middle school mentoring program. So this is a program I've been through with for about five years. It's definitely looking different. We communicate on Snapchat instead of me bringing lunch. Uh, but it's one hour a week that you go and you meet a sixth grader and you stay with them sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, through those transitional years. And you just bring them lunch once a week and sit down and talk. We play cards. We did a lot of different things. Um, I'm also very proud to be an ambassador with the Latino Chamber of Commerce here in Pueblo, Colorado. We're very blessed to have them. They do a ton for our business community. Um, they've got a lot of different resources that are available, and it's a place that's been near and dear to my heart for many, many years. Uh, so I take a lot of pride in being able to serve and be a part of the, the activities that they put on and the way that they support our community. 
Uh, there's also the Greater Chamber of Pueblo, and I'm not an ambassador, but I am a member of them, and I got to take part in a really cool experience called Leadership Pueblo. This is very shaping for me. Um, it's what got me into the board uh, memberships and, and really in getting involved in the community. Uh, you sit down, with, you, you are part of 30 different people in a group, and you go through about six months of uh, field trips is what I called them because they were fun, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, through that, I got to meet a bunch of the other people that that help with the chili and frijole festival that we put on every year here in Colorado or Pueblo, Colorado. We're very proud of our chilies. Um, and I get to help and volunteer at those at the chili frijole festival, which I didn't know is completely run by volunteers through the greater chamber. Uh, but I didn't learn that until I got more involved. So it's something that I think is very cool and fun. Um, one of the ways that I love working and getting to know more people is by networking. And my networking group is near and dear to my heart. We're the rock stars. We meet once a week. We get together. We learn about each other's businesses. We build that network so that I can be a resource to my friends and clients and family. When they have a need, I usually know somebody who can meet that need for them. And if I don't, I can reach out to my network and find it. Um, I really enjoy my time in Pueblo, Colorado. Like I said, I love working in the restaurant industry. I love volunteering. And one of the side things that I kind of do just as a fun thing is um, the right mix, which is my bartending service, where I come to your house or your party and I provide all of the normal things that a bartender would provide to you at a restaurant. Um, and we have a conversation about that. But it's a lot of fun and an easy way for people to kind of make sure that the only the people they want to be drinking are or that nobody's partaking too much. Um, really what drives me to do all these things is my family and this is some more pictures of me and my family. I love living here in Colorado. That's one of us skiing. All of our kids are able to ski on their own which is a ton of fun and then on the right is me and my wife um, celebrating the annual kickoff dinner in Denver with New York Life. It was 20s themed. We had a blast. Um, this is my extended family, so I think one of my brothers was missing from this trip, but we all got to go rafting down the Arkansas. Uh, you can see my parents, my brother and his wife, and my kids and my wife. Uh, we had a ton of fun splashing each other and falling out of the rafts um, at, on the river, and we just love doing all things Colorado. We've got a cabin in Rye we love hanging out at, hiking, and uh, just spending time together. And then finally, my, my heart and soul is these three children. They're really the reason that I decided to leave restaurants and go into full-time work and, and be entrepreneurial and, and do better for myself. Uh, this picture was taken uh, with them in your, your Ray when they were on a trip with my parents. And I think it totally speaks to them because they are three of a uh, kind and I sure love them to death. So uh, thank you very much, Reed Weber. Have a great day. Good evening. Good evening. Lucille Carcentino, representing Roselawn Cemetery. And my topic this evening is preserving history since 1891. Founded in 1891 as Riverview Cemetery, a for-profit. Platted on 350 acres from the present location north to the Arkansas River. Acreage was reduced to the current footprint of 131 acres, eventually named Roselawn Cemetery. The corporation was liquidated and became a nonprofit, and in the year 2000 officially renamed Roselawn Cemetery Funeral Home and Crematory. In 2011, gopher infestation had deteriorated the grounds. The endowment care fund had shrunk, was underfunded by 1.6 million. The concerned citizens for Roselawn Cemetery spearheaded passage of House Bill 1068, which allows stakeholders to attend board meetings. And, and financial records. Community joined hands with the restructured board and ushered in a new era. 2013, under the leadership of Kevin McCarthy as executive director, the new era began. Kevin's expertise and experience made Roselawn's preservation and restoration not only a possibility, but a reality. 2014, the LaBert Hogue Foundation funded the new Rose Garden and Fountain, which was Roselawn's brand. In 2014, the entryway was also enhanced by the new wrought iron fencing and security gates made possible by the generosity of the Bob and Doris Johnson Foundation. The new fencing and security gates were dedicated on the same evening with the Rose Garden dedication. Both plaques proudly stand in the Rose Garden as a lasting tribute to both of these foundations. 
As we enter Roselawn Gates, we enter into Pueblo's history, which includes people from every walk of life. Governors, senators, congressmen, business magnates, bishops, clergy, sports luminaries, farmers, factory workers, and countless immigrants. 2,000 veterans from the Civil War to current day Middle East conflicts have been laid to rest at Roselawn Cemetery. 2015 was the first military ceremony held at Roselawn. The unveiling of the headstones for the three African-American Civil War veterans and one white officer was conducted by the American Buffalo Soldiers of the West out of Denver, Colorado. The four unmarked graves were discovered when we began research to secure a listing on the National Historic Register of Places. In 2016, to honor Roselawn's 125th anniversary, a replica of the Vietnam Wall was hosted. Community donations underwrote the entire event. The Wall But Hills was a four-day event attended by over 5,000 people. In honor of all Vietnam veterans, particularly the 64 Pueblo Sons who made the ultimate sacrifice. June 19, 2017, the date that Roseland Cemetery was officially listed in the National Register of Historic Places. This was a culmination of endless research, due diligence, and the generosity of Victor King, a reminder of the significance of Roseland's history, which is as solid as a rock. The designation is beneficial in obtaining grant funding. 2,000 veterans are interred on our grounds from the Civil War to current day Iraq and Afghanistan. The year 2017 participated in the 100th anniversary of World War I with a ceremony at Memorial Hall. Of our 150 World War I veterans, 12 did not have headstones and they were obtained through the VA and the generosity of donors. The year 2018, Roselawn Funeral Home and Cemetery was recognized by the Greater Pueblo Chamber of Commerce for their contribution to the Pueblo community. Proudly, the Small Business of the Year Award was accepted and is an example of the great things that can be accomplished when a group of community activists and a board of directors work together. Also in 2018, the Hearts and Souls of Roselawn, Volume 1, was published and released by the Roselawn Foundation. The book was underwritten by the Pueblo natives, Carl and Carol Bongiorno. To date, the book has sold 1,400 copies. It is the diversified history of many who contributed to our cemetery's rich history and Pueblo's melting pot, and it will take you from tears to laughter. Auntie Liza's story was the background for our book. Her monument, funded by the generosity of Puebloans, born into slavery in the year of 1788, property of the Daniel Boone family, died in 1893 at the age of 105, came west at the start of the Civil War with the Boone family. Upon emancipation, she moved to Pueblo and worked as a washerwoman and a nursemaid. Why was Aunt Eliza and 650 other African Americans buried in Block 12 at the front of our cemetery because originally the front of the cemetery was actually the back of the cemetery. Originally people of privilege were to be buried on the bluff overlooking the river. Forfeiting the land changed the boundaries and the original plan. The year 219 was the beginning of two annual events, Day of the Dead, an annual Mexican holiday held in November. Reese Across America held in December commemorating our veterans. Sadly, the year 2019 was the year we said goodbye to our beloved Kevin McCarthy as he lost his courageous battle with cancer. Rudy Krasovic accepted the board's appointment as executive director, director and we continued to move forward. Storyboard Project launched Memorial Day weekend 2020. Warren C. Dokum, Civil War veteran, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, decorated by President Abraham Lincoln for his bravery at Sailor's Creek. Our goal is to have a storyboard for each story that was published in our book. Would you like to see the storyboards? Maps available at our office, Monday through Friday, eight to five. The three public tragedies, the 1904 Eden train wreck, the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, 
and the Great Pueblo Flood of 1921. Many of these victims are buried in the historical section, some possibly in mass graves. Grant funding was obtained to conduct ground penetration radar to determine the location of the mass graves. And we are pleased to introduce to you the Colorado School of Mines senior students that you see on the screen. They completed the preliminary ground penetration radar work pictured here with the great GPR work with the GPR equipment they used in an attempt to identify the mass graves. However, their work was halted due to the COVID-19 restrictions. The work will be completed this fall, data compiled and released to the public. Roseland adopted the words of Benjamin Franklin as they are as relevant today as they were over 200 years ago. One can tell the morals of a culture by the way they treat their dead. Funding has been received from the Buell Foundation earmarked to erect storyboards for each of the three Pueblo tragedies. Unveiling will coincide with the 100th anniversary of the Great Pueblo Flood in June of 2021. Please visit our website, roselawn1891.org. Our website offers an opportunity to order our book, which makes a wonderful gift for family and friends. Become a member of the foundation. Four levels of membership are offered, individual, family, supporter, and corporate. How can you volunteer, learn more about our events, learn about our history, and how to sponsor a storyboard? We would like to thank the Rawlings Library. On behalf of the Roselawn Board, our directors say thank you. President Jack Quinn, Secretary Jane Mazur, Treasurer Bob Root, members Yvette Francois, Rudy Krasovic, and Mike Ochato. The Roselawn Foundation, who serves under the auspices of the Roselawn Board, yours truly, Lucille Corsentino, President, Secretary Kathy Bassino, Treasurer Don Pagano, members Karen Kite, Rudy Krasovic, and Susan McCarthy. Advisor Jane Mazur, and a special thank you to Marlon, File, Marlon Lyles for creating this Roselawn PowerPoint. Thank you. Hello, I'd like to share a pathway to transformative resilience or turning challenges into new strengths. Um, in pursuing transformative resilience, I'll call it TR for time's sake, it's important to identify what you're most passionate about. Ask yourself, what do I want to solve? Once you know what you want to solve, look for a road less traveled. What is a more innovative way of solving this? Where is this work most needed? The answer may lead you just down your street or to a whole new region. If your terror work will lead you to another region, it is important to ask yourself, how in in this am I in? Are you a little in? Are you all in? Are your toes just getting wet? Are you cannonballing right off the high dive? Wherever your uh, transformative resilience work leads you, it's where you need to be. Many organizations are led by teams in one region, but the actual work is done elsewhere. While you may be able to delegate certain aspects of your work, your passion will not be refueled as readily and responsiveness to changing needs is compromised. Our all in was going to complete empty land um, in an RV after selling our home and everything we owned to be able to start <laughs> our journey of transformative resilience. Once you're out there, show up for your community uh, so that your community will show up for you. Attend meetings, support fundraisers, and volunteer hours for other organizations. It's a great way to network, discover the opportunities and challenges in local policies, and build the support you'll need to be able to do your work. All right. Determine the questions that you can't answer for yourself through research, and then ask those questions to the community. There's no replacement of data that is any bit better or more effective than the actual lived experiences of the residents of a community. This deep dive should go uh, to the roots of the causes of the challenge you're working to solve, and a solution-based mindset of assets and areas of growth helps keep the conversations, work, and community fueled by an energy of positive action. And when asset mapping, consider, how can each piece meet multiple needs? For example, this garden tower built by participants of our programming addresses limited growing space, water conservation, reducing waste, pollution, food security, and the local economy. 
Multiple functions increase resilience. Memorable experiences create enthusiastic supporters. A piglet reading a book on pigs in their favorite library and accidentally sign it with a snout kiss ignited these children's desire to participate in future programs. The librarian and her branch also became partners in promoting our work. And then determine how are you going to feed your work? Will you rely on foundations through grants and funds from donors? Be financially self-sustaining through sales of goods and services or a combination of both. Each option requires different skills, resources, opportunities, and challenges, and all should be thoughtfully considered. And think outside the box. Invaluable resources can come from the most unexpected places. An acquaintance may have a coworker whose spouse is a professional grant writer. The owner of a gallery may have a degree in social policy. When meeting new people, the best way to be interesting is to be interested. This has the additional benefit of helping uncover hidden help. For any trans uh, transformative uh, resilience work to have a lasting impact, it cannot rely on any single group. We always hear that there's strength in numbers, and that's true. However, there's greater strength in diversity. Seek to include in individuals across ages, races, ethnicities, orientations, and much, much more. Your work becomes better for it. Foster youth agency and leadership. They are capable of much more than we tend to remember. Many savor being trusted with responsibility and being truly heard. Empowering children to have a voice in their community's future is the surest way to inform that your TR work will thrive for years to come, much like these seedlings being watered by Ben. Get organized. There will be questions, numerous questions, and getting caught not having thought something out tends to send up warning signals to whomever is asking. Have a clear plan of action that includes who is doing what when it's happening and how it's going to be done to help avoid awkward missteps, both in conversation and action. If it looks like you haven't put much thought into what it is that you're doing or that you're missing key components to your process, it makes um, people very concerned with getting on board. All right, branding that is clear and concise, memorable is key. Be sure that the name and message matches the work that it's promoting. It makes your efforts easy to find share and remember. So this is a Grow Feed Change project. The longer version is Grow Food, Feed People, Change the World. But we use this on everything that um, we promoted with updates for that, um, that effort. Build excitement, make connecting with your work, whether the capacity on the capacity building end or the receiving end of the services um, and goods is an experience filled with joy. Um, there is so much negativity in the world, but um, whenever someone brings joy into it, people gravitate to that. They also remember it um, and tend not to forget it. Get started. This is the dividing line between the talkers and the doers, where the rubber meets the road. This is where someone should do something about that it becomes, I'm going to do something about that. You don't need an expensive or elaborate setup. Many great movements have grown out of garages, or in this case, a booth at an RV. Sharing what you're doing on traditional and social media platforms is effective and should not be underestimated. But sharing your experience, support, successes, and challenges with others who are interested in starting uh, the same type of work in their communities is where truly um, transformative work happens. Get your work into the community. Make sure that the process isn't a simple handoff of goods and services. And when you're ready, invite the community to join the effort. If you shun up for them, they'll show up for you. Be sure you are ready before they arrive to increase enjoyment and productivity. Nothing makes um, volunteers more nervous or unsure if they want to return than to arrive and not know what the plan is and what they're supposed to do. When you get your goods or services into the community, 
don't have it be just as a simple exchange or handoff of the goods or services. We're here, we're gone, or here you go, have a great day. When you create systems that foster a continuing um, exchange of dialogue and actions, you build lasting relationships and deepen impact. It also creates a culture of tr transformative resilience in your community. Reflect, rethink, retool. In creating a practice of continuing improvement, you, the work, the community, and outcomes consistently increase in impact. There is always room to grow. And whenever possible, create economic opportunities through your work. Returning the power to provide for one's community to the hands of its people is truly transformative resilience. I'd like to thank the Rawlings Library um, and everyone here tonight for being able to be a part of this wonderful group. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Derek Lopez. I've worked in education in Pueblo for nearly 19 years. They say home is where the heart is, and I have found my heart and my home in Pueblo. I was born and raised in Pueblo, but I was excited to leave as a young person, and I was able to pursue a doctorate at Stanford University. Years later, when I returned, I fell in love with Pueblo again. Let me tell you why. Pueblo is considered the home of the heroes. We are honored to have this distinction for the bravery of those who came before us. We continue to be heroes in many ways. To me, educators and families who have adjusted to remote education in a short time are the heroes of Pueblo right now. This has been very challenging and I applaud you. Continue to do the great work for our children. This is a picture of a smelting process and Pueblo, as you know, is known as the Steel City. Pueblo is a working class town with the values of hard work, diligence, and personal responsibility. My father was a steel worker and I grew up learning those values of hard work from him. These values are indicative of what it means to live and work in Pueblo. Keep working hard, Pueblo. Pueblo is a town of great tradition. We can boast the oldest rivalry this side of the Mississippi. There's the Bell Game with Central and Centennial, the Cannon Game with East and South, and the Pigskin Classic with County and Pueblo West High Schools. These rivalries foster incredible school and community spirit unlike any other place I have lived. Play on, Pueblo. Pueblo is known as the Gateway to the South. This is a picture of the Gateway north of town. This is important to me as I appreciate the racial and ethnic diversity of this region, the landscape and the environment in Pueblo. And most especially, our 300 days of sunshine mean access to a lot of outdoor activities, which I appreciate. Pueblo is renowned throughout the state for its great mountain biking trails. This is a picture of my mountain bike facing the sun in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Pueblo has dozens of miles of trails that can accommodate all skill levels. Living in Pueblo affords access to these trails with just a few minutes ride from home. It's a great place to get your cardio and be out in nature and just enjoy being outside and getting some fresh air, especially during this particular era in our history. Pueblo is a rare city that has a kayak park right in the middle of it. In the summer months, this picture is of me surfing the kayak park in the Arkansas River. Uh, in the summer months, you can enjoy this place with a boat, a uh, surfboard, a tube, or a fishing pole. Uh, this is one of the best outdoor recreation spots in the country, in my humble opinion, and people from all over the country travel to Pueblo to experience this park. A couple of years ago, it was featured in the New York Times. We should be proud of that. This picture has a few of my favorites within it. My daughter, paddleboarding, the Lake Pueblo Reservoir, and the snow-capped Pikes Peak. The reservoir is a great place to fish, camp, boat, paddleboard, or just spend some time in quiet meditation. What a tremendous resource we have in this community that adds so much to the quality of life here in Pueblo. Get out there and enjoy it. This photo is of Union Street during one of the many festivals Pueblo has to offer. You can see the vendors and all the people having a great time. If you've been there, you know there's excellent food, drinks, a sense of camaraderie, live music, 
and representation from all aspects of our community. Union Street has wonderful businesses and it's a great place to spend some time relaxed, having a cup of coffee, shopping, and just strolling around downtown Pueblo. Another gem in our community is the Riverwalk, just adjacent to the Union Street. Again, it's a beautiful place to take a walk, get some exercise, have a great meal, listen to music, and just enjoy the downtown. I deeply appreciate the Riverwalk and its role in fostering a sense of pride in our community. The Riverwalk really makes Pueblo a unique place to live. One of the hallmarks of living in Pueblo is the great green chili that has grown here. It's the best green chili in the world. It's good for your health with vitamin C and capsaicin. It's a staple in our economy, and it's an integral aspect of one's identity as a resident of Pueblo. Thanks to all the farmers in the county who provide this delicious, healthy, and versatile crop. I eat it nearly every day. Thank you. As you likely know, Pueblo is semi-famous for being the home of the slopper as its appearance on the food wars. Sloppers are delicious and are an icon of life in Pueblo. An open-faced burger covered in green chili and sometimes fries is a must-have for all, and especially goes well with beer. There are a variety of places one can get a slopper in town, and I recommend trying them all. Pueblo is home to three great breweries, the Brews Ale House, Walters, and the Shamrock. Each of them have unique aspects, and collectively they offer delicious food, excellent drinks, outdoor play space, live music, desserts, family-friendly atmosphere, and are conveniently located near downtown. You can walk to other things and try out a lot of different things when you're, when you're down there. I recommend these places. Pueblo has two great institutions of higher education. I have worked both at PCC and CSU Pueblo in the classroom and administrative offices. I know firsthand the many lives that these two institutions have positively affected. I also know that there is a great K through 12 educational ecosystem that offers students a variety of uh, opportunities. There are traditional public schools, charter schools, online schools, and, and available to create access to all. This is a picture of traffic in Pueblo. I moved here from Los Angeles and it took me hours to get everywhere. In Pueblo, you can get everywhere in about 10 minutes. The Americans spend about 40 to 50 hours a year in traffic, and the statistic is worse in larger cities. This is not the case in Pueblo. It currently takes me 8 to 10 minutes to get to work, which adds to the quality of life here in town. This is a picture of me and my friend and percussionist, Matt Trujillo. We're playing music on a little stage at this place called Wine Down by the River. You can see it's a snowy night in the background, yet we're having a great time entertaining ourselves and other people. Pueblo has a great many venue for artists to create, perform, and exhibit. In addition to live music, there are the First Friday Art Walks and the Sangre de Cristo Art Center, which is also a gym in our community. Make art, Pueblo. Pueblo is an, an ideal location to access many of the wonderful sites and opportunities within the region. To the left, you can see a picture of Red Rocks Amphitheater, two hours to the north. In the middle, you can see a picture of Monarch Ski Resort, two hours to the west. And to the right is Mesa Verde, which is just a few hours to the south. Uh, all those are in quick access from Pueblo. You can get there and generally return back the same day if you'd like. Pueblo is a great place to live for that reason. This picture is of the Rawlings Library. In addition to its great architecture, the PCCLD offers so much to our community in terms of access to literature, archives, events, and technology. Additionally, Pueblo has a variety of entities that provide cultural and educational enrichment to our communities, including the El Pueblo Museum, Center for American Values, the Rosemont Museum, the Pueblo Heritage Museum, to name a few. Another great resource in the community is the Colorado State Fair. In the late summer, families have access to a plethora of entertainment opportunities. There are rides, rodeo events, concerts, delicious food, and great company. It's something I always look forward to as a child, and I have found that my children look forward to that as well. So many great memories have happened here, and so many more will come. This is a picture uh, of my family, and because Pueblo is a place where multi-generational families can live, work, and thrive. This is my daughter, my mother, and my grandmother. Research indicates that there are positive effects for children and grandparents when they are involved in each other's lives. Pueblo is a place where this happens often. I love Pueblo. Let's continue to work together to make Pueblo a great place to live. Thank you very much.
Hi, my name is Karen Vogelsong. I'm the new executive director for the Pueblo Arts Alliance uh, and the Pueblo Creative Corridor. And one of our youth programs is the um, Impact Youth Initiative. And I am so excited to be a part of this amazing team. I just want to introduce you to some of the really cool people that I have been working with at this beautiful organization. Please meet Eric McHugh. Eric is our facilities coordinator. He is a sculptor working primarily in metal, but I have yet to discover the limits of his versatility. He tackles everything we do um, from working with youth programs to watering the plants. And we're privileged to have him be a part of our team. I call this the gallery of creation but you might be thinking, wow, that's a hallway. It, it's a hallway. <laughs> um, we rent creative spaces for um, below market rates so that people can have, a, have an opportunity to have a studio as quickly as possible. Eric helps me to take care of these studios so that our tenants don't have to worry about um, you know, general maintenance, toilet paper in the bathrooms and such. Here's Eric working with our Impact Youth Initiative. And um, basically, he's just really great at translating uh, various uh, complicated information to different skill sets, which is invaluable to us for so many of our different programs. This is him working on a belly box. This is Recycle Man. This was also made with the Impact Youth Initiative, and it is one of Eric's metal sculptures. Um, this was in response to Impact deciding that Pueblo needed more recycling uh, receptacles, and this will be permanently installed at El Pueblo Museum this coming Tuesday, and we're very excited about that because it's been in storage for a little while. Not that it hasn't been used, but it's just been in storage. This is uh, Sandra Burrier. Sandra is an activist and a multimedia artist, and she, they are our um, impact, oh wait, she is the Art Hub 410 Activator. They are the Art Hub 410 Activator, and their job is to help the community be involved in this space through unusual or unique events and gallery rentals. This is the outside of the space. This um, mural was created by Eric Saracino, and our Impact Youth Initiative helped to implement the uh, painting of the building. I just think it's so beautiful. I love driving to work every day to see this on my way in. If you have an event, let us know. We can accommodate. This is our first ever online gallery. This was in response to our April 1st Friday walk in our COVID stay at home orders. And this will not be our last online gallery, but uh, Sandra was also able to interview some of our local artists and uh, it was a unique event. We had a lot of fun putting it on. It wasn't without technical problems, but it happened. And this will eventually become permanent. Here's Sandra again for May 1st Friday art walk. Uh, this time she decided, or they decided to go with a different design altogether, and we also went after local businesses. This one was Emily Gradishaw with TikTok, and I think it went out pretty well. Uh, Sandra also went out and interviewed some folks out on, out on the town. This is uh, this most recent First Friday Art Walk in June, and we kicked off a month-long event of trivia night and here's Sandra showing off the uh, gift certificates that we got from Solar Rose Coffee. John Mark Wiley was the host and we'll have a totally different host tonight um, and a brand new prize. So check out, see what's going on. She also did some walk around town kind of interviews. Please meet Heather Fuller. Heather in many ways is the heart of our staff and her title is the uh, innovation and outreach coordinator and she works to involve the community in many different programs right now she's dusting off the um, website so we can get that up and running and we hope that it will eventually be the permanent home of our online gallery part of her uh, programming is the street beat usually this um, 
happens outside the whole thing from the auditions to the final. Um, but this time we had to move it to virtual and it was quite a crazy event. This program um, allows licenses for performers, um, a safe place and um, a lucrative space. Out, We work in conjunction with the city to make it happen. Here are um, some of the photographs of some of the people that joined us in our virtual event. Uh, this was a challenge because of uh, using up web space and there were many people that had no idea how to utilize the functions of live Facebook and those kind of things that we were teaching as we were getting them on the air. Somebody was working with somebody in the background while somebody was auditioning. And this is uh, 2019 uh, Corn Mother. Cynthia Ramu, she is the art activator for um, the youth initiative, the Impact Youth Initiative. Here is one of our belly boxes. The youth wanted to help promote um, sharing. And so you can drop by one of these belly boxes and stick food in or water, or you can take things out. There's still one at uh, City Center and Grand. Here are our Impact Youth Initiative at the Central Plaza, which they decided needed to be cleaned up and beautified. And this is what you're looking at, a little bit of their art. And then in the inset, we're looking at them at TikTok, working on individual tiles, which will eventually be brought together in an installation piece um, from many different Impact uh, participants over the years. This is Impact Youth with their WINGS project, and this is an association with stamping out domestic violence. Um, they, were, they educated themselves on all different kinds of domestic violence. Sometimes it was a little sad, but they persevered, and these WINGS are meant to be uh, pop-up photo opportunities that will be distributed around Pueblo for anybody to enjoy, and remember that we can all have WINGS. This is... Um, Impact Youth going online for our virtual programming. We did uh, Pueblo Live Creative Studios. It's still happening Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. And we've covered everything from glass blowing to worm casting. And we've got more in store. So join us or check out some of the ones that are still hanging out on our website. I think it's Pueblo is amazing. So Impact also helped to sponsor a COVID chalk art installation piece at Bingo Burger. This is in their parking lot. You're looking at Adele Aguilar, Amy Milne, uh, Bob Marsh, and Spencer Little, who were chosen. Their pieces were chosen out of all the entries. And uh, they got to eat Bingo Burgers, and we got to pay artists to help out a little bit during this stressful time. And here you're looking at out on a limb, which is a band, we tried to start a live concert series on Friday nights, and it got a little wonky really fast with all the different people chiming in for such an extended period of time. So it ended up being a recorded concert series. And we're not sure exactly what we're going to do with this yet, but it's it was fun, and I think everybody had a good time. I've heard some good comments from folks who really enjoyed hearing the music. This is an artist rendition of the outside of the Alliance building, and we're really excited that this will eventually happen. It's in the works. It's coming. And, you know, there might be a little change here or there, but we'll, we'll get it. And you guys, come join us. This is about Pueblo and about creative industry and helping us all to move forward and thrive. So I appreciate you all, everybody, Pueblo, and thank you, Rawlings Library. We are living in difficult times, coronavirus, agonizing awareness of and the need to address systemic injustice, racism, and police reform. For many, the intersection of these fears is heightening other life stressors like everyday responsibilities with work and family. Though stress is a natural, physical, mental, or emotional reaction to life, when one's capacity to adapt and respond is exceeded and the sense of well-being is threatened, well, this is stress. Now, keep in mind that a person's reaction to life stressors is individual and depends on a perception of what is stressful. For example, 
while wearing a mask or modifying daily routines might be stressful to one person, it may be no big deal to another. Acute stress is the most common type of stress. It is the body's immediate reaction to a new challenge, event, or demand, and it triggers a fight or flight response. This causes a series of physiological change that occurs very rapidly. The heart races, the breath quickens, muscles tense, and stress hormones flood the body so it's ready to react swiftly to life-threatening situations. As the threat subsides, it could be a few minutes or a few weeks, the acute stress response is dampened by the parasympathetic nervous system and its role is to balance and maintain overall body systems restoring a state of calm, allowing the body to relax and repair. If, however, a person feels continually overtaxed by life, though the stressors may not be immediately life-threatening, the body remains on high alert and a tremendous cost to the body and the brain result. Chronic stress can lead to high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, digestive conditions, and to depression, anxiety, and burnout. It may also lead to maladaptive coping, which is an attempt to get rid of the stress that in the short term relieves symptoms, but doesn't resolve the root cause. These may include things like excessive drinking, drug abuse, smoking, overeating, overworking, over Facebooking, even over exercising, all of which in turn may cause their own health issues. Well, we all know that a healthy lifestyle style is helpful to reduce and manage stress. Things including a wholesome diet, regular exercise, and enough good sleep. But you may not know that one of the most effective approaches to the management of stress is mindfulness meditation. Nearly 40 years of research documents the benefits of a mindfulness practice in lowering heart rate and blood pressure and in decreasing symptoms of stress like muscular tension, headaches, insomnia, skin conditions, and gastrointestinal distress. This research also shows that through the practice of mindfulness meditation, the immune system is strengthened Self-regulation of emotions like anxiety and depression is strengthened, and there are positive changes in the structure and the function of the brain. Researcher Sarah Lazar notes that one of the primary findings from meditation studies is an increase in the quality of life. Many people report that they feel happier and symptoms of stress don't bother them as much as they used to. Now, mindfulness meditation is not a cure-all, but it does seem to benefit most people in some way. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is the basic human ability to be fully present, aware of where we are and what we are doing. It's a type of meditation in which the focus is on being awake, sensing, feeling, knowing the present moment without interpretation or judgment. The practice of mindfulness meditation itself is a teacher. We begin to see the ways in which we're not awake, how we sometimes move through life on automatic pilot, 
react out of habit, how quickly we can become judgmental of ourselves, of others, and even of life itself. We notice how the mind works, of how often we're caught in the past or planning for the future, when in actuality, the only moment we have is this one, right now. I invite you to pause. I invite you to notice your breath. Be curious and interested. What can you know about this breath simply because you're paying attention? Not thinking about the breath or trying to change it, rather sensing the breath and feeling the breath as it moves in and out of the body. The mind will wander away. This is what the mind does. As you notice the mind wandering, just gently invite it to return the focus of its attention again and again to the breath. Attending to the breath with kindness, and with generosity toward the self. The practice of mindfulness meditation is simple and yet it's not easy. When practiced regularly, mindfulness meditation reverses the stress response in the body, restoring homeostasis and a state of calm. Mindfulness is good medicine for the dis-ease of chronic stress. The side effects of this medicine may include better long-term health, increased resilience, and a greater capacity to live with happiness and peace. Mindfulness meditation is supportive of well-being and of the flourishing of mind and heart. As physician, author, poet, Dr. Zhang Vo writes, right now when it seems so hard to breathe, right now, just breathe. Wow, what a great group of local presenters. Thank you all so much. Let's give them a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you all for the questions that have come in throughout the night. We did receive um, a handful of questions for some of our presenters that we will go ahead and um, start with. Our first question is for Joan. And this question comes from Trey Green. I am interested in trying Cambodian food. Are there any local options? Um, there isn't any um, restaurants in Pueblo that specializes in Cambodian food, um, but um, Kwan's Kitchen has Phnom Penh egg rolls, um, K-U-A-N, and Asian tropics. During the winter times, they have Kithiu, it's Cambodian noodle soup, almost like pho, but I'm biased, so I like Kithiu better. <laughs> um, so those are the two dishes that you can try in Pueblo. If you go up north around Aurora, um, there might be some more options, more authentic to my food. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Our next question is for Lucille. And this question is from Simon Tierpak. Does Roselawn plan to have fall events this year? Yes, we do. Uh, we started an annual event in 2019 in November's Day of the Dead and we plan to do that annually from here forward. Uh, if we really uh, want to have the community get involved. So the way we're going to do it this year for 2020 is we're going to have the first 12 people that come in sign up and they will be allowed to tell their stories of their deceased loved ones. And we're going to have altars that will be erected and that they can go ahead and place their mementos on those altars. So 
it'll be very nice and we really want to encourage the community's participation in that. Thank you. Thank you, Lucille. Our next question is for Reed coming from Martin Vigil. How does someone get involved with your networking group and what specifically does the group do? Well, I'll start with what we do. We get together every week. Uh, we have about an hour and a half long meeting. We start at four, we end about 5.30, depending on how much chit-chatting we do. Uh, the first 30 minutes is really just kind of free form. Everybody talks to everybody, whatever. But then for about an hour, uh, we go through the group. Everybody gives a 60 second commercial about who they are and what they do um, and what referrals are looking for that week. Uh, we, every week we have a different presenter from the group. Uh, that will talk more in depth about their business and how it works. And then at the end of the meeting, we go around and pass out referrals and give testimonials about people in the group um, so that we can all hear about how our experiences were with one another. Um, the way that you get involved with our group is by showing up, and that's the way you stay involved as well. So <laughs> you come, everybody gets two free meetings um, that they get to come and join and, and do all the things that the group members do. After those two meetings, we will ask you to join, and um, dues are $100 per year, so very inexpensive, and, and I'm sure you'll earn way more than that by being a part of us. Thank you, Reed. And our final question um, is for Derek. And this comes from Mary. If you had to choose one final Pueblo meal to have before you went into quarantine, what would it be? Well, if I had to choose a meal before I went into quarantine, I think I would actually choose a day of eating before I went into quarantine. <laughs> if that were really the last time I could eat out, I think I'd probably start at Betty's Burritos in the morning and then go to the Grind Cafe for a California sandwich probably get some sushi at Miyake's and go to Mr. Tandoori's for Indian food, go to Nacho's for a chunky burrito and go to Brew's Ale House for some beer and a burger and then finish it off at Bingo Burger with another burger. <laughs> and then I would probably not eat for a week. But that's what I would do if it really were that way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Derek. Again, thank you all to all of our wonderful presenters for coming tonight and for sharing their stories and their works that they are involved in in town. Uh, we hope that everyone will um, stay tuned for our next Pachaca Cha that will be coming up in October. Um, if you or anyone that you know or if you have an idea for someone that you would like to hear from as a presenter, uh, we're looking for eight more presenters in October. So please comment below um, or give the library a call um, with your ideas. So again, thank you all for joining us and have a great evening.